Hello everybody, this is Robin Michael here for the final uh, Facebook Live session for the Benedetti Foundation. It's not live, it's pre-recorded because of my uh, historical uh, um, issues with the Wi-Fi uh, where I am. Um, and what I wanted to do today is a follow-on from yesterday's creative tutorial where, because I'm uh, next week doing a, a digital concert uh, performance of the Beethoven Septet but with period instruments I've had to uh, restring my cello um, so that it's in the state of a sort of 19th century early 19th century instrument and, and that's with gut strings you can see well the, the lower strings the C and G are covered gut but the A and D can you see the difference in the texture of these strings um, that is what we call raw gut and it's a very different sound um, it's a I wouldn't say it's a different technique but it, it demands from how we use the bow and how the left hand reacts to the bow a very different approach um, particularly with this hand and of course you can see that I'm actually although for the project next week I'm going to be using a classical bow um, uh, have, I got, have I got a classical bow to hand hang on I'll show you a classical bow um, This is a classical bow, so it's almost like the modern bow. Uh, you can see the tip is pretty much the same, and the uh, the shape, what we call the camber, is is almost identical. But of course, the frog, you can see, it's an open frog. Um, this actually, <laughs> this is material that you can't now take to many countries. Um, but this was made in about 1790 by an uh, English bow maker, John Dodd, although. The dot, it's stamped here on the heel, and the first D has actually been sort of rubbed out over time, so it just says odd. Anyway, um, that's classical bow, but I'm going to just do a little bit of work with you with my Baroque bow. Um, and this is going to feed into what we've been talking about with the improvisation, about how we, we get this inegal feeling, in other words, unequal feeling between down and up. That means we can swing the music more. Now that applies to when we're playing in a jazz style but it also applies for when we're playing a lot of Baroque music, particularly French Baroque music like Rameau and Couperin. Uh, and also just th this idea that the, the down bow is very much a sort of uh, the important gesture with the up bow being much more of an uplift and upbeat gesture. So just to, to show you my Baroque bow here, this is a copy of Boccherini's bow, it was one of the great uh, 18th century cello virtuosos, and you can see, those of you who haven't seen a Baroque bow before, that the, the shape of it is completely different, yeah, uh, and at the point was a very elegant point, but I can tell you that this is about 20 grams uh, lighter than a normal, 15-20 grams lighter than a normal bow, the main difference being the weight here, it's, it's, it's much, much less. Um, you can hold the bow at the at the frog if you want. I choose not to just because I find the weight distribution easier to manage holding it a little bit higher up the stick. But the important thing is, and what I want to share with you today, what I want us to work on together, is just how the bow reacts to the string, and particularly you'll hear with my cello now strung up with gut strings, I have to work to make each note speak. Now, it's this speaking that's important, because with a Baroque bow, if I, I'm just going to pick up my modern bow here, and even with gut strings, although slightly less so, you can sort of put the bow down in the string, and it just kind of everything works. The natural weight of everything from the tip um, to the heel. And we've, I think in the last sort of 100 years or so, the emphasis um, very much with string playing is, is making everything sing, which of course is very, very important no matter what music we're playing. But it's become um, a sort of habit for us to articulate in a way where we start notes with a wah sound, in other words, a sort of vowel-like sound. And it's one of the, the worst habits in string playing where you hear this and a bulge. That's one of the things that I, I find absolutely um, abhorrent in string play. Now the thing is with a Baroque bow, you can't even get away with that. 
you have to start the sound off with a consonant sound. Now this is really important because when we talk about speaking, when we're, we're, we're talking about music, speaking the music, it actually is a literal thing that we, we need to try and make a consonant sounding uh, articulation with the bow. So in other words, if I'm, when I engage with the string, um, you can hear there's a sound. It doesn't matter if it's down or up. And if I don't have that, you'll hear what, if I play this like I could do with a modern bow, it's just, the sound skates. So I'm very much concentrated in that way, and that's something that we're going to do a bit of together. But I just wanted to do a, a, a little exercise with you, because for me, the, the, the tradition where this speaking through the bow comes from is very much Italian. Italian Renaissance, uh, think of composers like Monteverdi, for instance. Um, and the Italian language itself is a, is a great sort of pointer I think to our string players about how to speak with the bull. So what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to think of your favourite Italian dish uh, and see if you can, with the sound of the Italian, produce those consonants and vowels with the bull. So it might be spaghetti carbonara. Now that sp is something spaghetti carbonara. Spaghetti carbonara. You can hear how the inflections on certain, it, it's such a, a vivid language for that, which is why go and listen to Monteverdi Madrigals and you will be blown away. The, the, the rapport with how the singers pronounce and how the instrumentalists then try and reproduce. So um, now you, you try your own one. It might be, I know my children love Pasta pesto. Now, pasta pesto is not the most interesting rhythm. So, what if? What about we had pasta pesto con rucola? Pasta pesto con rucola. Pasta pesto con rucola. Yeah, your turn to, to think. Maybe a, a pizza. Uh, uh, quattro stagioni. Quattro stagioni. Quattro stagioni. There, I had to elongate quattro. Stagio. That's any more French than Italian. My mum would pick me up on that. Um, so I want you to make up your own, if you like, word games with your favorite. Just pick a menu from your favourite Italian restaurant. Of course, it's probably all just now takeaway um, with the lockdown. But try and see if you can use the, the, the actual letters and the consonants, the relationship between consonants and vowels that you can then put to how you use the bow. And then you will find when you come to start working on your unaccompanied Bach, for instance, I'm sure the cellists here have all um, had a go at the first. And you can hear how I'm setting the bass note off with a, 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 a consonant sound. And that resonance then allows me to articulate uh, with, with the, the, the notes in the DNA string. So I'm going to go back to my, get my modern bow and show you one of my favourite exercises for, for being able to not only show the difference between vowel and consonant sounds, um, but actually this, this thing is very important when we're playing well, in fact, all music, of being able to vary the point of contact and the bow speed. So in other words, yes, we're all told that we have to keep a, a bow that's straight and even, playing and pushing. But there are very, very few pieces that I've ever encountered where we have to, where we're actually asked to stay in exactly the same part of the string with exactly the same bow speed. It would be like me talking like this all the time in a bit of a way like a zombie. And unfortunately, um, it's actually, it's easy to fall into the habit of playing like that. When we're thinking about the left hand, the bow starts to kind of just do its own thing. For me, everything comes from what the bow is doing in terms of bow speed and point of contact. And then it's, uh, everything fits to that. So, I want you to get your metronome. I've got my, I wish I had my old, old fashioned metronome, but unfortunately now, like everyone else, I'm using one on a, on a phone. And I want you to set it quite slow. Let's see what we're going to do. Let's put it down to C. 
60. It's a nice round number for you, 60, okay? And this exercise I learned from one of my musical heroes who passed away last year, the great Dutch cellist Anna Bilsma. And he was all about speaking with the bow. Uh, and also the bow for him when he was playing, certainly on a company Bach, the bow never actually leaves the string. You do all the articulation within the string. Um, so we've got a metronome on. Now this requires an open string, a bow, and a little bit of mathematics in the head, which um, translates to the bow. Okay, so what we're going to do, we're going to count up to seven, which I'm sure everybody watching this is capable of. And I want you to, with the down bow and the up bow, we're going to have seven beats on each bow. And I want you to divide the bow up mentally in your head into seven equal parts so that the bow speed is absolutely constant and the point of contact is absolutely constant. So we're going to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one. Stop. So we're going right from the, the absolute start of the hair right to the end. It's like when, when we're talking about uh, in, in, in the, the world of cooking, using the whole animal when we're talking about going from nose to tail. We're going to go from heel to point. Okay, so we're going to do that again. But then the second time we pull the down bow, we're going to do it for eight. And the up bow we're going to do for six. Now the point about this is that for the eight, of course, if you think about it, we're going to have to use a slightly slower bow. And for the six, we're going to have to use a slightly faster bow because we're keeping the same tempo. So what we're going to have to be doing is as we're coming in from the slower bow, um, the slower bow is going to be the down bow, we're going to have to change the point of contact to come slightly higher, closer to the fingerboard, and have a slightly faster bow of course, if we, if we change the speed of the bow but kept the same point of contact, the sound's going to crack, okay? So, let's do seven and seven, and then eight and six. And the most important thing is that you use, we're going from, from head to toe, if you like, heel to point, okay? So here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, and right, four, into the heel. Now, eight. So this is going to be slightly slower. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Now, did you see? I slightly changed the points of contact, but I just let. I, if you just let the ball as you're pulling, you change the direction with your arm. Again, it's never ever straight lines. Okay, so let's do eight and six, and then guess what happens after eight and six? It might not be a huge surprise that we then go to nine and five. So you can hopefully start to see what we're, we're building up here. So here's eight and six. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and six. One, two, three. And my arm is lighter as well. Six, and then nine. And now I'm starting to really feel the resistance. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, and one, two, three, four, five. Let's do that again. Nine, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, one, two, three, four, five, ten. Now, with each of the increments, I'm having to get closer and closer and closer and closer to the bridge, and then further and further and further away. Okay, so this is what this is all about, and it's, again, we're always working here with circles. So let's do our 11 together. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and three, one, two, 
I'm keeping the resonance of the sound even when I'm the resistance is almost I'm, I'm pushing the, 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 the possibilities of the sound right to the, the, the furthest they can go and I know some of you are bet your teachers always tell you to get closer to the bridge well this is what this exercise is also about doing so now we're going to do 30 actually let's do 12 and 2 one time and then we'll do 13 and 1 and if you just have the feeling I don't want you pressing what I'm doing, can, can you see even starting off the note, it's the same for violin, starting off the note, I'm just pulling on, I mean, the thing is, with these gut strings, you have to engage in that resistance, otherwise the sound just goes, it sort of chokes. So I'm, I'm making absolutely, it's, it's my own natural body weight, there's nothing being imposed um, onto the string. I'm letting the string support the bow and I'm pulling. So this is 12 and 2. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 1, and that's 13. that up is like an upbeat when we breathe in uh, we say in French souffle uh, and, and, and that's what the dessert uh, if you talk about having a uh, making a souffle it's, it's that sort of idea let's do 13 again and just enjoy I, I'm there's something there's, there's a sort of visceral quality that you should be finding and don't worry if the sound cracks it just doesn't matter it's like it's actually builds my also used to actually try and, and <coughs> find out how, what was the absolute limit he could go on the bridge. Just to, uh, sometimes if the sound did crack, actually the instrument then opened up. It, it, interesting, but try it. So this is our 13 and 1. Um, Feeling. Now, I'm going to switch the mention them off because that's driving me crazy. The thing about that is, um, I would like you, in your in the company of your own, well, own home, to do that incorporate it into scales. Because once you start um, finding the discipline of being able to, to change the point of contact and both speed with your every... With, with whatever you're playing, and I didn't know what I was playing there, I was just making something up. What you'll find is that the bow, you can start to use the bow in a much, much more creative and speaking way. So, I've gone back to my Baroque bow just because I was enjoying using it. Um, and do, do go and get one of these. You can get them Chinese uh, Baroque bows for next to nothing. Uh, and it's, it's just nice to feel how the... the the stick feels in the hand. It, it is different, and but the, the thing that makes the most difference is actually strings, gut strings. Um, couldn't recommend them highly enough. Now, um, I want to apply what we've been doing with the speaking, the consonants, the vowels, and just with the that exercise with bow speed and changing point of contact to a little bit of uh, sort of 17th century improvisation. Now. If you go back to any of the treaties from, from that time, violinists and gamba players in particular talk about divisions. And a division is literally just taking an interval of two notes and dividing them up a little bit like what we're doing with the modes. 
Uh, and so that meant that a composer uh, could, well, a composer, a musician, could come up with a simple bass line and then start to improvise on that. Now, I think I've said it before in one of these sessions that actually the word improvisation didn't exist until the mid-19th century. They would talk about um, playing a fantasy. And that idea of fantasy, I, I, I love, and I think it's really important that we always keep that, that idea with, uh, with ourselves. Um, so I want to, I'm going to give you a bass line, um, and it's a sort of ground bass. We're going to start on a D, and it's going to be a four note bass line, and it's quite a sad... Baseline. And of course, if we harmonize that, the grip, and one of the reasons that I've chosen this key is that actually our open strings work very well. I'm double stopping a little bit there with a, an E, but just, just to keep it simple, when we come to the B flat, we can use our, we can use our open D and A with that to create this fantastic B flat major seventh sound. And then, of course, the A. What is the um, the 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 meaning of that A? Well, that A acts as our dominant to take us back to D, which is why this four-note grand bass works so well. You get, this is the sort of thing you hear a lot in Purcell, uh, and in fact, um, in the Bach suites for us cellists, we have. Um, <laughs> So it, it's exactly the same idea, but we're just going to keep those four notes just now. Um, and if you want, now, um, the exercise we've just done, I start the D and release the sounds, and then I get closer to the bridge, just so I can, that's the colour I want for that B flag. But it's so easy to do this, as long as you've got the bass line established. So, I'm going to show you how we can sort of build up our, our sort of improvisation on this. And I would start just with, okay, we've got our, when we get to the B flat, we can, put the, we can put the open strings on. But let's just start, let's go back to our ground bass, changing the point of contact to the B flat. And once, the thing is, um, for all you bass line players out there, ground basses are just fantastic because you can just get completely lost in the sort of hypnotic elements of it, but then also always inflecting. And the, the, the genius of Purcell, when he had a ground bass, was that he would actually be able to change what happened on top in terms of the harmony, but keeping the same bass line. Um, there are many, many examples Go and listen to as much press out as you can. So we're just going to start with the, the the note that's two above the root notes, in other words, the third. Okay. So there's our bass line. And then just as the third. Wherever you like. Bit. 
you can feel the, the open strings that work on when they can work. But the, the important thing is that this, it, and of course, everything is connected. There, there, there were some really interesting questions in the last few weeks about when you should practice technique, when you should practice music. And for me, everything is connected. And even the fact that this bass line is cyclic, it goes in a circle, it's exactly the same as the bow arm. We're always working in cycles. So we've got a... We've got a third. Now if you want... You can join the, the, the root and the third up with a note in between. And you might you might actually play the you might play a note in between that doesn't work. You might you know straight away that doesn't sound quite right. So now that the A because that acts as a dominant there, we do definitely want to have a C sharp, but we don't have to. And actually, the, the ear already, I think, tells us that that is implied, as long as you don't play C natural. But I don't want to make this complicated. So let's just join a root and a third. And then if you want the fifth, came down. So again, just simple little steps. And then you can see I'm starting to open up. I'm starting to use different registers, different octaves, but using the open strings. Now, um, I know I've gone a few stages uh, ahead there, but this is just for you. What I, my uh, my wish is that you just take a bass line that, that, like this and just start mucking around um, with it at home. If you've got one of these apps that you can record yourself, put that on a loop, and so that then you don't have to play the bass line each time. It's actually a very good um, uh, technique to develop doing. And then you can start doing more divisions. What we just did, joining up the roots and the third, is effectively division. Or then you can start adding in ornaments. Um, again, listen to how singers ornament in Monteverdi. They, they do these incredible uh, effects that almost uh, sort of Eastern effects. And that's something, again, all these things, you are free to, to, um, to experiment. So just to sum up everything we've talked about today and to give you a little few pointers about how to develop all of this. We started off by taking our Italian restaurant menu and trying to reproduce the sound of the Italian with the bow. In other words, thinking, you, you, using the bow in terms of consonants and vowel sounds. And that's incredibly important, this, this, this speaking language that we're, that we're all engaged in, which is music. And then we took our exercise of bow speed and point of contact. We did, you can choose whatever, I mean, I actually go much slower than that, crotchet equals 60, and started off dividing seven and seven equally, and then working sort of away from each other, so it's eight and six, nine and five, always adding up to 14, until you get 13 on the down bow and one on the up bow. And of course, you can practice that the other way around. There's nothing to stop you, but it's, it's such an important technique, this idea that the down bow, is where we, we have the sort of impetus and the up bow is where we have the feeling of upbeat. Um, I mean, there's so, we, we, we've been in D minor and I, I think instantly of... Um, you can hear... At the down... And that's 
sort of sinking into the sound. That's how the, we get the music to dance. Very, very important. So we had our exercise for bow division. And then we took our simple ground bass line, which of course we know that Bach uses this technique and um, Purcell in particular, Monteverdi, uh, countless composers of that time. And then we, we just started to see how we could use from the bass line, just using thirds to start with, joining those notes, the fifth as well, and then joining these up in scales. Now you can take this as far as you like in terms of virtuosity flying around but as long as the harmony always works like that um, it will be wonderful and if, if this is something you're interested in something that I've been looking at in the last couple of weeks um, some, some things I did I hadn't come across before Ortiz who was a Spanish uh, gamba viola de gamba player he actually wrote out many of his improvisations um, so you can see what the, the, the players of that time, how they were thinking as well. And it's, it's, it's exactly the same as how jazz musicians today think. Very, very important that we, we make that connection uh, together. Um, so I hope you've enjoyed that um, today. Uh, if there are any questions, do ask uh, Laura at the foundation. She can pass them on to me. I can get back to you. Um, I'm aware that probably some people have been asking if I was playing with a spike today. And of course I wasn't because in this sort of music, um, it wouldn't. The spike didn't didn't exist. And actually, it's something for cellists that I think is really important that you you see how it feels to play without a spike because you're more mobile. Actually, you're not so sort of rooted to the ground. You still need to be rooted to the ground with your feet. Um, but that's something that I think can, can be nice to develop in your play. And when you go back to using a spike, you will feel uh, freer. So I hope you've enjoyed that. Um, find a, make up a ground bass, um, improvise, and above all, just enjoy the resonance of the instrument uh, and all the harmonic possibilities that you can find. <laughs>